grace greater than our sin. As we continue now with this part of our service being a sermon, this will be over two videos, so they should just roll on together on the playlist. So uh, please sit back and uh, listen as we proceed. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, that you are our God. Thank you, Lord, that you give us so much in your word. May your word be written on our hearts and our minds. May you speak to each of us today through the message that you have prepared, Lord. May it be your words that I speak and not mine. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, this is the second message in the series on grace. And today's message is titled, When Grace Doesn't Seem Fair. The movie Amadeus tells the life story of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, highlighting the questionably contentious relationship between the composer and his contemporary composer, Antonio Salieri. The film portrays Salieri seething when the aristocracy applauded Mozart's genius and then his conspiring to thwart Mozart's success. Some historians and music aficionados dispute whether Salieri's jealousy of Mozart um, and his talent is rooted in fact or fiction. But what isn't disputed is the ability most people have to identify with feelings of envy at the news of someone else's unexpected good fortune hmm. or an undeserved reward particularly when the wronged person feels that these blessings should be rightfully theirs. In today's scripture, Jesus tells a story that explains why it is that grace doesn't seem fair and why this should be something to appreciate. And so first of all, we see that God is a God of grace, not simply a God of justice. When you look up the word justice in the dictionary, these are some of the meanings. Conformity to this principle is manifested in conduct, such as just conduct or dealing or treatment. The administering of deserved punishment or reward. The maintenance or administration of what is just by law as by judicial or other proceedings, such as a court of justice. Or judgment of persons or causes by judicial process. So justice, according to the dictionary, is getting what we deserve. <clears throat> we get the consequences of our actions, good or bad. But what about grace? This is what the dictionary says about grace. That it is favour or goodwill. A manifestation of favour, especially by a superior. Mercy, clemency or pardon or favour shown in granting a delay or temporary immunity. So grace is getting what we don't deserve. Our actions deserve something worse than what we're actually shown. Jesus explains this story to show how God operates within the context of his kingdom. You see, God is sovereign. No one can tell God what to do. They might try. I shared last week how I told God not to forgive somebody. That is not my right. We can't tell God what to do. God also knows what justice is and what it should look like. But he's also a God of grace. He decides who gets grace and who doesn't. Or rather, he decides what grace looks like for each of us. And it does look different for each of us. He decides what he does, not us, not you and not me. In this parable, God is represented by the landowner, the vineyard owner. And so we see that what someone else receives is not our concern. I remember when the boys were little, and I have their permission to share this, I think, from memory. I remember when they were little, and Caleb was very like me. He wanted to see justice done. So when Alex would cheat or do something to him, or be perceived to have done that, he wanted to see Alex get his justice. And so we had to explain to Caleb that he won't see that justice happen. But to trust us that Alex would get consequences for what he did. Like me, 
Caleb didn't like that too much. He wanted to see his brother suffering, don't we all? <laughs> he didn't always think that the consequences were enough. And it's the same in our society today. We often feel that our magistrates have got it wrong when they seem to give more than lenient or less than adequate sentences for crimes. But for better or for worse, it's up to the magistrate to decide on the sentencing. They may know things about the guilty person that we don't. It's the same with God. After telling the story of how a vineyard owner gave the same wage to those who worked one hour as to those who worked 12 hours, and how the vineyard owner justified his right to do so, Jesus then equates this with God by essentially explaining that with God, because of his grace and choosing, some who seem first will be last. And some who seem last will be first. God is sovereign. And what someone gets is not necessarily our concern. We live in a world that wants fair or wants equity for everyone. If you do the same job as me, then we should get paid the same. Our church's own guidelines um, do the same thing. It's actually biblical. To pay a person what they're worth. Paul addresses this in 1 Timothy 5.18 when talking about how to treat and pay elders in the church. He says, For Scripture says, Do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain, and the worker deserves his wages. So we should pay people fairly for their jobs, regardless of whether they are male or female, race, ethnicity. If they do the job, they get paid. If they can do the job, pay them for that. But in this parable, Jesus isn't talking about fair. He's talking about grace. And when grace doesn't seem fair, we need to remember it's also about trust. You see, God promises to those who trust in him. The denarius represents God's general universal and numerous blessings that he gives to all those in the kingdom. And just like there are certain things that we receive simply for being married, there are certain things we can bank on when it comes to trusting God in and through Jesus Christ. One of those is eternal life. John 3.16, you all know this. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Anyone who is saved and strives to live a life of holiness receives this. Then there is the forgiveness of sin. Acts 10.43 talks about this. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Again, this is part of salvation for all Christians. But God also promises power over sin. And Paul talks about this in his first letter to the Corinthians 10.13. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. God promises power over sin if we take it. There's also the promise of his constant presence. And the writer of Hebrews talks about this in chapter 13. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. And God also promises purpose and meaning for our lives. And we see this in Romans 8, 28. And we all know, so, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. God gives grace to us when we claim Jesus Christ as our Lord and Saviour and give our lives totally to him. And so we trust for his promises. 